I grew up in East Anglia, in a really small town uh, mm. on the coast in East Anglia. Uh, my parents emigrated from India um, in the sort of late 60s. So in East Anglia, we were the only brown family in town. So that was kind of my life where I grew up. So I was always different, essentially. I worked my way up in corporate. I was vice, global vice president of sales and marketing for a FTSE 250 company. You know, I had a big global team. And I had a moment where I was like, is this really what I want to keep on doing? It felt like the world was falling apart. It felt like businesses didn't know what to do. And there was always scrambling around. And we knew a lot of women in their stories where they'd asked to work remotely and the bosses had said, no, your role isn't possible remote. And overnight they made it work. So to create a really inclusive culture, it takes a lot of introspection to look at how you communicate, how you work, how you deal with anyone who's experiencing challenging behaviours, how you encourage people to have challenging conversations with each other, with people who are quite different to them, um, how you progress people in the organisation. You know, what does your leadership team look like? Are they all quite similar? Because if that's the case, then that's reflected in the organisation. I still hear stories about, um, let's give you an example, women being made to sign NDAs and given some money to shut up and go away. There's quite a lot of that you'll be surprised um, and then and obviously you don't hear about that because they can't talk about it so many things about our society need to change so there is a positive story about change but there is so far to go i believe everyone has a story to tell through seeking true authentic insights about the entrepreneurial journey I'll provide a platform for our peers to share their stories and inspire those that listen. This is the County Business Talks podcast, produced by H2 Productions. Hello, Mo, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. How's the voice doing? <laughs> The voice not doing so great. I've got <laughs> I've got me honey and lemon, and I'm, uh, I'm I'm getting through it. But we're doing okay. We're doing okay. We're surviving. So, <laughs> mate, listen. Thanks so much for jumping on. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your support. So, thanks for inviting me on. Uh, yeah. Something. Where um, well, look, this is this is guest twenty one or twenty four. Um, <gasps> wow. To welcome, watch this space. We're going to jump straight in. Tell tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your and your story and, and career. Yeah, I'll I'll do some talking, Sam. Save your you voice for you. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you asked me to tell you about my story, so I thought I'll start right back at the beginning. So I grew up in East Anglia, in a really small town uh, yeah. on the coast in East Anglia. Uh, my parents emigrated from India um, in the sort of late 60s. So in East Anglia, we were the only brown family in town. So that was kind of my life where I grew up. So I was always different, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of stayed with me all the way through school, that I was the one that was always different, doing different things. Yes, faced bullying and all of those things. But actually, I think from that, learned that it's okay to be different. And it sort of, that stayed with me, I think. Um, mm. And then when I was going to come into university, that's when I came to Brighton to university mm. and absolutely fell in love with the place. And I haven't really managed to leave for long ever since then. So I've done lots of things, but I always somehow gravitate back to Brighton because I love it. Um, yeah. Absolutely loved university, Sussex University. I'm still very much in contact with them. It was fantastic. Mm. And then when I finished my degree, so I did a degree in English literature, went to London for a bit. Then I was like, what am I going to do now? I need to earn some money. Um, and that's when I really started working in, in marketing initially, but then into sales. And I realized that technology sales was really what I was suited to because the skill in tech sales is to understand complicated technology and explain it to people by telling a story. And I realized that actually I was quite good at doing that. And I really enjoyed the selling and sort of jumping around the world. So that's what I did for many years working in lots of different companies selling all kinds of technology so i've sold um strange things that go in radiotherapy machines that help zap the tumor i've sold chips that go into technology i've sold things that go in security systems you know any kind of odd technology that's the kind of stuff i've sold and i you know i found that i learned so much having been someone that wasn't interested in science at school i learned a lot about tech and sort of then moved into software sales as well and 
you know, I've loved sort of understanding how code works and UX and all of those things. Um, and, you know, I'm someone, I think a lot of kids from it who have parents who have immigrated have a lot of pressure on you to achieve. So yes. there's a lot of pressure of like, you know, you've got to survive, you know, you've got to make money and all those things. So that's what I focused on doing for many years. I worked my way up in corporate. I was vi global vice president of sales and marketing for a FTSE 250 company. You know, had a big global team, flew around the world, traveled all the time, was never really at home, hardly ever saw my husband. I was always sort of working really, really long hours. And for a long time, I loved it. I absolutely like buzzed from it and it was fantastic. Until there came a point, I think really the company I was working for got bought by a bigger American corporation. And that meant that I wasn't at the head office anymore in London. So I was going to have to go to California like all the time. And I had a moment where I was like, is this really what I want to keep on doing? Um, and so that's the, the moment where I thought, no, it isn't. And I um, stopped doing that and started working in Brighton and worked for a fantastic software company in Brighton called Magix. I don't know if you know them, they're a, they're a great software company. And it was like, it was life changing because suddenly I wasn't like traveling to work. I was just walking down the road. Um, I didn't have to get 20 signatures to get something signed off. I just walked around the corner, spoke to the owners and they said, yeah, crack on, that's fine. And so it was really like showed me a different way of working and kind of what work life could be about rather mm -hmm. than it always being the pressure of shareholders and all those things. So it was brilliant and I absolutely loved it. And I was there for a couple of years. And then it was just before the pandemic, actually, that I'd started uh, freelancing as a sales director consultant. Um, mm. so that was in like October 2019. So I was doing that until the pandemic. <laughs> and at, the, at that point already, when I was working in Brighton, I'd met my two business partners because they run a group called Brighton Digital Women. And I'd basically, when I stopped commuting, I thought to myself, do you know what? I could do nothing with this free time that I've now got, or I could try and do something with the time. So I started working for volunteering for a couple of charities and I joined the Brighton Digital Women team to help organize events. So I'd already met them and that, that group was about women in the tech sector, networking together, practicing speaking, supporting each other. We had speakers in for events as well. So we were already doing that um, right up until the pandemic. Um, and then it was, it was then when the pandemic hit, so it was sort of that early 2020 phase was when we then sort of, sort of transform what we were doing into this idea of watch this space. So yeah, there you go, that's my little journey. Wow. Oh, what, an, what an amazing journey to, to share and thank you for sharing that. I think so because I'm really keen to like, obviously I, I, I met you not long after you'd obviously launched Watch Your Space we'd done the virtual awards and you was nominated for the award um, yeah and, which was really exciting I think but like you, you launched then during the global pandemic talk, talk to me about like, obviously the, the decision obviously to to launch at that at that time I guess you know a lot of yeah. companies a closing at that time and 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 really struggling and wondering what they're doing and then you're launching a business at that time so talk, talk to me about that yeah so we were in that space where i was consulting so i ha i did have clients all the way through but i was consulting um yeah. allegra was also consulting she was a freelance consultant <laughs> At the time, Rachel was actually on holiday in Japan at the early stage of the pandemic. And we were saying, oh, Rachel, I think you might need to come home now. But she was still on holiday. And when she came back, we were just on a lot of Zoom calls together, like a lot of people. Yeah. Our business was launched on WhatsApp and Zoom. We were on these calls and we were saying, you know, it felt like the world was falling apart. It felt like businesses didn't know what to do. And there was always scrambling around. And we knew a lot of women in their stories where they'd asked to work remotely and the bosses had said, no, your role isn't possible remote. And overnight they made it work. And we saw um, a lot of women suddenly having to do childcare. And it really did seem like it fell a lot to women to do that. And so yeah. we, we felt, really felt like we wanted to do something about that. We saw, we just kind of felt like the world was changing overnight, how it worked. It felt like the biggest work from home experiment anyone could have imagined. Um, and just the whole rethinking of purpose, you know, businesses were really, really in crisis at that point. And it was through all of that that we said, you know what? It's not just about women in tech. And Rachel and Legra had already had the idea for Watch This Space about a year before that, just hadn't progressed with it. 
and we were like well do you know what we've we're stuck in our homes we can't go out anywhere it'll give us something to do why don't we just try thinking about what we could do to make it a business and I really don't think at that stage we thought we'd be where we are now it was an idea it was something in the background um we were like it gave us it really gave us something to do because it gave us something to really focus on and it just kind of progressed from there and honestly if you like in 2020 if you'd said to us that we'd be where we are now we would not have believed you we had no idea what it was going to turn into I love that though, the, the, the kernel of an idea is there and just, actually we've got this bit of time, because obviously you, you like, you know, I've talked to you a few times and your positive energy and enthusiasm for stuff, you can even just listening to your story, like talking about the, the, the places you've worked and, and the enthusiasm for working in even that sales environment as well, but actually I need to change, so I'm going to do this and then I embrace that and that's great and you can, t so between you and, and Allegra and Rachel, get into that point again actually let's push this forward and you know it's a, a negative situation that which is covid and the global pandemic but let's take something positive out of this and where we'll create this business and and see where we go with it and and wow what what, what a last couple of years yeah it's been i mean it's been absolutely incredible it really has so yeah we when i first met you is when we've been nominated for those virtual oh, awards yeah. that you did yeah, yeah. and it, it really just took off from there we we hit on something that was a real challenge for businesses and all types of organizations actually, where they know they want to do something about diversity and inclusion, but they don't know where to start and how to get going on that. And that's our, that's really where we help people to get started and work out what they're going to do. And also we launched, it was probably April, 2020, when we set up yeah. social media and everything. And then it was the summer of 2020 where it was the Black Lives Matter movement and suddenly everybody was thinking about the kinds of things that we were working on and so we got a lot of attention quite quickly and really just hit on how to talk to people because we found a lot of people were pointing out problems but not necessarily giving people solutions and mm. also people are just scared a lot of the time they don't know what to do and how to, how mm. they should talk about things and you know what they should actually do about a problem they know exists but they don't know how what to pro pro progress with really so we so, that's what we hit on and progress from there i mean talk, talk to me to just explain i guess to the, to the listeners a little bit about what's your space what it is what you got what you guys do and 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 that's yeah. a really good context to, to, to that yeah so just explain to the listeners a bit about that yeah so um essentially the three of us had already worked a lot on diversity inclusion so when i was in corporate i did loads of work on um diversity and inclusion programs i learned a lot i learned that you can recruit people into the graduate and apprentice schemes but if they have a bad experience they won't stay very long and that used to happen quite a lot so that's that we used all of that to launch watch this space and so what we do is um usually our engagement starts with people where we do something called an inclusion audit where we have a whole big discovery phase where we do discovery workshops with people across the organization we do a survey, we look at policies, we look at procedures, we look at all the data about an organization, we look at their communications, their reputation, we often talk to clients and partners, and we build up a really good picture of the organization and then give them a score for our six pillars um, for each area, things like communication and people. And then we give them a roadmap for change, which we break down into different sections. So there's, there's always some quick things they can do and then sort of six to 12 months and then longer term. And we work with them on that roadmap for change because again, often people get stuck there. Now what? So we help yes. them with that. And then as part of that, we offer training as well. So we do training on things like um, inclusive communication, uh, unconscious bias, and, you know, all sorts of different training. And so that gets rolled out as well. And then some people come to us directly for training as well. That's another very popular service that we sell. People come to us for training and we train their teams either in person or remotely. Uh, and we have like an e-learning platform as well. And then the other arms, what we do is communication. So people need to communicate what they're doing, not only internally around their organization so that people don't worry about what's going on, but the external reputation is really important. And we really encourage our clients to talk quite openly about the fact that they're on a journey and they're working on diversity and inclusion. It's amazing. I think now, certainly for me, like you said, I listen to you talk about it and there's, I, 
again, I guess things like diversity and inclusion, sustainability, those type of topics that companies know that they need to address. But one, like you said, they don't actually know where to start. I know I, know I need yeah. to have a more um, diverse and inclusive culture within the company. How do we start that? We've never looked at that before, but we need we know we need to now. So coming to you guys as a starting point, I guess. And But not what was fascinating actually about the, the model you've created is not just about how you can educate people, but actually giving them the tools to be able to, like you said, follow a roadmap. Because that's an, that's another battle, isn't it? Because there's so much education out there. People can go and maybe listen to podcasts or they can um, get information from articles and other bits and pieces. But actually then knowing how to, the best way to implement those things as well. And I guess. Yeah. How do they actually translate that into action? So sometimes we talk to people and they say, oh, well, you know, we advertise jobs, but no one different applies. And it's like, okay, so you're blaming people for not applying for your jobs. Actually you need to think about this a different way. We say, right, let's have a look at how you're communicating. What are you saying about what it's like to work there? You know, what does your social media say? What do you say? You know, people need to look at their organization and themselves rather than somehow putting the blame on people for not applying for their roles. Yeah. That's quite a common thing we work on is recruitment. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, talk to me. Look, I, 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 again, I probably on every episode of the podcast I've recorded, I always, I always talk about culture. And, and certainly from, from this conversation, I was so excited about obviously having this call with you and, and talking about. So, you know, culture in companies is, is, as I say, is something I find fascinating. But talk to me some of the things that companies should be doing to, I guess, to create a more inclusive culture. With it. Can you give us some top? Yeah, tips? yeah. There's can... lots of things there. So, um, creating an inclusive culture really takes thinking about who are all the different types of people that that could could work in your organisation not just yeah. the people who are like you. So yeah. we advise our clients when we see things like, you know, they talk about, we go for beers on a Friday. Okay, who are you really appealing to when you when you say that? There's nothing wrong with going for beers on a Friday, but you need to be aware that you're then excluding quite a lot of people who might not yeah. want to do that. For me, that's always a bit of a red flag, things like that, where they say, we do this, rather than talking about variety and including different types of people. So to create a really inclusive culture, it takes a lot of introspection to look at how you communicate, how you work, how you deal with anyone who's experiencing challenging behaviors, how you encourage people to have challenging conversations with each other, with people who are quite different to them, um, how you progress people in the organization. You know, what does your leadership team look like? Are they all quite similar? Because if that's the case, then that's reflected in the organisation. So it takes a bit of those kinds of questions, which is the work that we do with people. We do ask quite challenging like questions to people to say, well, OK, well, let's look at this. What does that actually mean? Does that really mean inclusion? So another example that, that I'll see coming up now, because we're in sort of getting into late October, is a lot of talk about Christmas and Christmas parties and Christmas drinks and all of those things all great stuff and lots of people celebrate Christmas. I'm somebody that doesn't, I'm not that bothered about it. So if you're gonna just ram that down people's throats, what about other religious festivals? So for example, we've just had the one that my family celebrate in early October. You know, how have you helped people to celebrate their particular festival? You know, just, mm. just things like that. If you're gonna create a really inclusive culture, how are you going to make sure that people can actually be themselves and can talk about the things that are important to them. So I think there's a lot of talk about inclusive cultures that don't actually translate into actions. And it's, uh, again, it's, it's opening people's minds to, to that as well. Because like, uh, so many people, I guess you must talk to, me included as well, you listen to that and you think, nah, well, because we've always done that, everyone, of course we can always have a Christmas party and that, and that just seems like it's the normal thing to do. And that's, but change doesn't happen unless you address those, what, like you said, I guess the interesting thing is the questions that you ask people to do that. Yeah. So, like you said, great, great have a Christmas party, but yeah. there, are, there are other parties. We're not saying don't have a Christmas party, but understand that for some people that isn't what they want to do and they, they may have their own religious festival or other type of celebration at another mm. point in the year that's really important to them and it's the most important one for them and how are you going to 
enable them being able to celebrate that. That actually goes back to my life as a, a school child. When I was at school, we used to have this celebration in October that we used to go to in London. There's a huge uh, London celebration in Belsize mm. Park. And we used to go to it when I was a kid. And every year, my parents would have to have a conversation with my school and say, she's going to have like a day off. And it was never long. They never took me out of school for long, but sometimes it was like a day, maybe the Friday or the Monday. And every year they'd be like, what? They, they would be difficult about it. And it would be really like difficult, challenging for my parents. They'd have to say, well, this is really important to us so that yeah. I could go to something that was really important to the family. And it's just yeah. that, and I'm sure things have changed now in schools a lot, but it was just that fact that the fact that that bit of difference wasn't tolerated almost. It was like, you know, okay, we'll let her do it, but you know, you'll need to talk to us about it again next year. Yeah, rather than it just be a complete given. And of course that'd be in the diary every year. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, it's fascinating. I mean, what I'm, I'm interested then to see like what you, you're like, how do you feel we are as, as, I mean, are we moving in the right direction to create a more do you think like companies are or we as a society are moving in the right direction or is it a lot of um, do you find it's a lot of tick boxing exercises for some some companies yeah so that's a really really good question so we say we're not about tick boxes um mm. and you know our, our success i think has been about asking people questions and saying well ticking that box isn't actually driving change forward and i think that's been part of our success has been that we do do that so in terms of where things are going yes i do see some organizations changing offering more flexible work um trying to recruit different types of teams um be more inclusive in their language you know the kinds of organizations we work with where they're really looking at you know challenging subjects where they have to really look at themselves and think about how they're going to progress so yes on the one hand there are some really positive changes i think things are talked about more openly now so i think you know there was a time where if i said to somebody i've experienced racism in brighton people would say don't be so ridiculous and actually now i think people would would listen a bit more so i think they would understand that actually so many things about our society need to change so there is a positive story about change, but there is so far to go. I mean, we hear stories all the time about things that are not so good. So when Brighton Digital Women um, was work working as a networking group, we used to hear stories all the time from women who'd been treated badly in the workplace. You know, just story after story, a lot of businesses that you'll know, all sorts of stories. And you'd hope that that would have changed, but it ha there's still so far to go. I still hear stories about, um, let's give you an example, women being made to sign NDAs and given some money to shut up and go away. There's quite a lot of that, you'll be surprised. Um, and then and obviously you don't hear about that because they can't talk about it. So we know things about certain employers and certain people, but it can't be talked about because they've been silenced. Um, women who come back from maternity leave, um, and then pushed out of the workplace. That happens all the time. Uh, people experiencing microaggressions in the workplace and challenging behaviours that they have to deal with. You know that those things are, are going on all the time, and I, d I don't think everyone's aware of them. And so this, I would say, it's a sort of positive and a long way to go story. There's so far to go. There really is. And, uh, I guess from, from I, I'll tell you. I guess from my my own experience, I guess with with inclusion, just just I don't know if I've, I've mentioned to you about it before, but obviously my 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 son, um, like I've got I've got twins, obviously a boy and a girl. Yeah. Um, Luca still identifies as a boy, but dresses he's very gender fluid. So he go to school. Um, some days he in pigtails and a dress, and other days he dresses as a, what you class as a boy with trousers and as a yeah. ponytail. Or he's just got long hair, but he's he's really gentle and like, I'm, I'm i'm a guy that um i've always liked to think i've been very open-minded i grew up in dagenham in, in essex and um what we class as a man's man boys but whatever you talk about playing football etc that stereotypical society and and then my, my son's taught me so much about the world and and go embracing it from such a young age like from pretty much as young as he could point he's been, I, I want to. Um, I am different, and I I want to dress like that. And even to the point that I remember taking him up, uh, him and his 
sister they got, went to nursery and we got a call from the nursery and saying um oh sienna's got upset because luca keeps wearing her, her clothes so i'm like okay well, let's take it so i took him out come we're gonna go you can have whatever you want and i said what is it you like about girls clothes and he was like well um i, I like the bright colors so me still being you know naive to it and uh, picking up track suits and, so, and he's like I like that dresser and we will literally walked out with bags of dresses and he's got his own wardrobe full of his own dresses and he got and he's just really like i said he hasn't he's still at a stage where he hasn't identified necessarily as 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 a girl or she and we we constantly check in with him on that um and we there's a, a, a group called all sorts who we've we've got them involved with which is an amazing amazing organization and it's just really opened my mind and and, and the school actually with us have been brilliant like we approached him from day one and said look actually he's been going to nursery for two years dressed as a girl and he and and, and what what i guess there's been a bit of frustration on my part when i look at the even the the score even with with all sorts and went there's there's still we're still adamant on trying to put people in boxes maybe yeah to, to be, um where like when when we spoke to him about it and we had a, a talk with the score and with all sorts um and everyone was like oh what what do you want to be deferred to is he or she or they and he, he was just like, i'm luca and then that's what for me i was like wow he's he's teaching us at six years old he's going i'm just really gender fluid and i'm i just want to be referred to as luca and that, that, that and one day i'm going to feel like this the next time i'm going to feel like this and i think that like you said i, I think but there's still like i guess we go back to essex and there's it's not a, we're in a bit of a bubble here in brighton I think like, that I'd, I'd be interested to see, especially coming from working in London and, and where you are now, that, that, is it different in Brighton? I mean, you've, you've mentioned that we've still got a long, long way to go, but are we a Brighton further ahead on that type of stuff? Or are we... Yeah, I mean, yes, the answer, short answer is yes. Um, I loved hearing that story, actually, um, about your son, Luca, as well. My, um, <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice. My nephew's called Luca, and so it's lovely to hear a story because actually I think their generation, he's seven. He he has a skirt, like he's quite happy to wear that sometimes if you're going to a party. Yeah. I think that for younger generations, it's different. Yeah, a yeah. friend's son, um, for example, he identifies as gender fluid as well. And he's, I think, 10. I think they're yeah. just different, the next generation, in how they talk about things and understand that you don't have to put people in boxes and you don't have to be boys do this and wear that and all of those things. I think that there is more understanding amongst that much younger generation. And I really hope that we see that change and that people aren't pigeonholed, you know, like why can't girls play football? That discussion was had over the summer and things like that. You know, I think it's really, it's a positive move that we stop putting people in boxes according to their gender. I think it's time to start thinking differently around that. Um, in terms of where we are in Brighton, yes, there's no doubt Brighton is further forward on a lot of these subjects. Still a long way to go. Like I said, um, there are people still who are surprised when I talk about racism in Brighton because they don't think it exists. They think Brighton's really inclusive. And it's like, it is in lots of ways, really is in lots of ways. And, you know, you, you see different types of families and you know, different events and things that are spoken about, but there's still a long way to go. And, you know, it's not until we stop putting people in boxes like that, that we've really made that progress that we want to see. So yeah. I would say it's, it's great. And I think the schools um, in Brighton are really supportive because they have different types of families and, you know, all of those things. Um, and I think they are generally, but that's like, that's like a general, yes, they are. And I also think that the sort of central areas of the city are quite different to further out. I think yeah. you don't have to go much further for it to be different and for it to not feel so inclusive. So yeah. there's still a way to go, I would say. But, you know, there's, there's other places too. London can be, can feel really much more, um, sort of inclusive and yeah. different types of people around you as well but again depending on where you go in London yeah of course of course I mean have, have you since you've been in Brighton have you have you experienced racism yourself in Brighton or oh yes lots of times um over the years I mean I've been in Brighton for years um and yeah. to different degrees as well you know some of it's subtle um that's what it's something my mum's always said to me that racism in this country isn't always overt a lot of it's insidious and you know it's the way people treat you and the way people behave towards you as well as the more overt things so people when they think about it i think where people struggle is 
they say oh but you haven't you know like been beaten up in the street or things like that and it's like well that that isn't the only definition of racism there's so many other things that constitute racism you know you look at things like data around healthcare and yeah healthcare stop and search stats for the police and all of these things that you know there's so many things different ways it manifests itself that yeah I, definitely for sure and it's, it's not been that long ago actually that i experienced some racist behaviors in brighton so it's definitely there um but i would say you know on the positive it is a much more inclusive place than a lot of other places yeah yeah sure well um I'm, I'm, I'm getting obviously that it's, I think the, the work you're doing is brilliant because what, what you know again back to my learnings my, my personal experience I guess I, that he's taught me so much about the world in the last seven years which has been fascinating and I think for, uh, and helped me and Kelly like both on a journey through through that and to like I said for two people other classes has both been really open-minded to he's opened our minds to a completely new level of what that looks like which is was amazing and i'm hoping that you know we do move to a much more inclusive society as a whole and i think you know organizations like yourselves and what you're trying to achieve is 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 so much needed and ultimately like i said not not just for them because i think there are there's good people out there that want to want to do better but just don't haven't got the tools and don't know the best way to do it and i think not only by you guys coming in like i like i alluded to earlier not by only you coming in and and educating and, and giving the right advice but actually giving them the tools to make sure that they can definitely that people can really make those those changes that from a cut especially from a cultural point of view that they, that 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 changes at the core of everything that they do. So it's not just, it doesn't just become a tick box exercise that they don't just delve into, oh, we're, we're really diverse and, in, uh, and inclusive now because we've done X, Y, and Z. Yeah, Actually, and we say that, yeah, we say that, you're never done, it's, it's not a thing, yeah. right, we're done now. It's an ongoing journey. And it's also, we, do, we talk a lot about the benefits of inclusive teams as well because there's huge benefits of course it's the right thing to do and that's that's a huge driver for us but there's also huge benefits there's not so much data around that more innovation people are more productive people are happier they make quicker decisions you know there's so many benefits to having inclusive teams with different perspectives and different types of people that there's there's so many reasons to actually work on this and also in terms of the customers you want to reach they're all different as well so if you're only one type of person then you're going to struggle to reach all of these different types of people in the world so there's real business benefits too love that love that Talk to, talk to me and then obviously launching in the global brand you, you've obviously had great success over the last couple of years and um i know you won the award you won the twenty five thousand, didn't you i think it, in, that um, was it, yeah they're announcing the next winner today actually the oh, simply it, business business boost it's a year <laughs> on we were judges this year so we got to oh, wow. be involved in choosing i can't say who it is but we'll find out yeah. later today but oh, yeah wow. we so that was a year ago that we won that competition wow. And it showed us that you should enter competitions because somebody has to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is phenomenal. Right? But then I, I'm keen to, because of the growth and, and the success that you've had, and I'm watching that journey from last like, when, when we first met at the, the virtual awards. Uh, has there been some challenges along? What, what challenges have you guys faced along along the way? Because obviously, oh you look at it's been it's been phenomenal to see all the great stuff. In the, but I, I can imagine in the background, like, talk, talk to me about some of the challenges. <laughs> So yeah, so it, from the from at the outside, it probably looks like it's all really well <laughs> organised and we've been really successful and all those things. All of those things are true. Behind the scenes, um, there's been some real challenges. So you know, um, Rachel had COVID and was in hospital for a while. She's totally fine now. She had a baby. Allegra had a baby. We all, I think, we all moved house during this time. Um, we all struggled financially because when you start a startup, you don't make money straight away. So we all had to do other things. And it was actually a year ago that Allegra and I were like, right, we've won this national competition. We've beat 25,000 businesses. Now is the time to go all in. Because actually before that, we were just trying to do so many different things. And then it's the challenge of, as you know, when you found a business, you have to wear all the hats, you're doing everything. And so what we're 
strong on the three of us is sales and marketing which is actually the thing that a lot of other founders struggle with we yeah. have those skills where we struggle is things like you know finance and tech, like the it things and things like that you know so it's like trying to really juggle all of the different tasks to make yeah. sure the business is functioning properly and we've now grown so we um, are taking on our first employee soon we have yeah. a lot of freelancers that work for us we've got freelancer you know starting to expand around the country as well and it's running all of that takes up so much time and um i think probably a lot of founders you talk to will say this you know you can be working all hours we did a conference um the week before last and you know we allegra was up till i think one in the morning two nights in a row getting it all live and you know it's all of those things that there are sort of no boundaries on when you found the business you just got to do everything and you just got to make it all happen so there's been lots yeah. of challenges along the way definitely yeah. But how does that work with, um, again, the other thing I talk about work, work life balance that would, especially when you have founded a business and, and especially the early stages on these first couple of years is so crucial. You, you do feel like you, you, you've got to be on it all the time. But do, uh, have you got a work life balance? You set yourself good boundaries or how, how are you? Yeah. So, again, yeah. I think that's something we've learned to do. I don't think we didn't to start with. And so we've now got, so for example, Fridays, we don't really work. We do, you know, we do odd things. I might go to yeah. like a breakfast event or something like that, but we don't really, we try not to. That's a good boundary to set that we're getting a proper break from things. We work the hours we want. So we are remote first. We work the hours we want. So, you know, Allegra has small children. That's, that totally fits in with the business. She can collect them from nursery and school and all of those things and not have to worry about making up hours or anything like that we don't operate in that way it's about getting things done within the time that we've got so i would say we haven't um fixed again it's not a tick box you can check that work-life balance but we're really trying to make sure we set some boundaries and have time for ourselves so and we've also we're setting the company up like we would like it to be as it grows so we have yeah we're remote first no fixed hours it's about the task getting done um unlimited holiday it's about, you know, taking a break when you need to and just agreeing with everybody else that you're going to have that time off, not, you know, we don't want loads of forms to fill in and things like that. So we're trying to really do that. And we all do other things as well. So like we're charity trustees, um, you know, I volunteer for another charity. We try and do those other things that are really important to us as well, just to try. So I would say it's not done that work of the, the balance, yes. but we're really trying to focus on it because otherwise you just end up getting ill and yeah. struggling mentally and all of those things if you don't focus on those things yeah and do you, are you are you quite good at sort of switching off when you when you have got that so say for example you don't work on a friday or you've got them other bits to do that you can you can switch off from, from um <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. not great yeah. i try i try i really do try to not be on emails on my phone and things like that um, and certainly when I went on holiday, I took email and LinkedIn and things off my phone just to try and really get a break and get away from it. And actually, we did that in the summer. So we said uh, the year before, we said, oh, we should really just close in August because it's a good time to have time off. We didn't quite manage the whole month this year, but I think we will try and do that next year. Because I think you have to just say, right, there are times where, you know, we're not working on life and death. There are times where we can actually close down and say right we're shut for now and just come back to it when we're refreshed yeah, love that love that and then finally as we're coming towards the end it's, still, like, it's obviously been quite a few highlights over the uh, over the last couple of years as well with the with the winner the 25th day you won um win the dynamic or you won a business award yeah well. one dynamic award yeah so what, what's what's been the highlight for you would you say oh so um, a year ago, we were asked to dial into a Zoom call with Simply Business. We didn't know, we were stressing the night before and like going through our financial yeah. forecast and everything, so we didn't know what it was about. We dialed in and they hit record and said, you, they've, they've used the clip actually on social media. They hit record and then they said, we're pleased to tell you you've won Business Boost. And we were like, oh, that was, I mean, that was a real like changing moment for the business yeah. that just like felt felt like suddenly this was like a proper business. That really was amazing. And the, the Dynamic Award was also amazing. So we'd gone to that and our table was right at the back of the room. So we were like, oh, we haven't won. We're right at the back in the corner. So we kind of settled in. We're having a few drinks and everything. When it got to our category, they were putting the logos up on screen. So we said, oh, let's just film that. 
we've got the film actually of that where they were putting the, the clips up of the different companies and they started talking about the winner. It was Joanne Simmons from BOPC started talking about the winner. And she said, you know, a business founded in lockdown by three women about reimagining the world of work to include everyone. And we were like, oh, that's us. And we then had to like find our way across this room. And everyone who knows us who was there were like, yeah, where were you? It took you ages to get across the room to the stage. That was that's incredible. We had a, yeah. It was incredible. We had a fantastic night and, you know, that was another of those moments where it was just like, oh, this is incredible. We've actually like made something out of this. Yes, there's been there's been a lot of highlights along the way, but those two award wins do really stand out. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Well, look, it's been, like I say, from, from meeting you just after the start of lockdown with the virtual walls and, and, and seeing the growth and, and the success of watch this space and, and it's an amazing thing that you're doing it really really is and um and i wish you obviously continued success but tell me what what does what the future hold for you oh what does the future hold well we're already planning on how to expand the business so we've um we've got somebody working for us in the bristol area so we're starting to expand into that area and if that all works then we'll do that uh, nationally we've got some national clients as well so that's what we want to do is sort of replicate what we've done in this area in other areas around the country we are writing a book which we had a, we had a writing week in uh, earlier this year we just need to do some more work on that um so we'd really like to do that and try and um get a, get a book out there about the work about what we do so we're doing that as well um and really just continuing the the growth of the business so that we can um continue to drive change because that's it something we're all really passionate about so that's what we want to do and in terms of, of my future personally i also do lots of other things um so i'm a trustee for the clock tower sanctuary charity i'm a non-exec director at a healthcare social enterprise called here who in brighton as well uh, and i love doing those things too and just continuing that variety of life of having like different things going on i really want to continue doing that i love that i love that there's something about that for me, I similar. I spin a few plates, as you know, and but uh, as much as sometimes that you go, oh, am I spinning too many? So much on loads of things happening. At the same time, if I didn't have them things, I think I'd be a bit bored. I need to. I love having. I've just. I think I've accepted about myself that that's who I am and that's what I do. So it's, it's cool to be. That's like what that. I'm like too. So if I if I say to myself, I'm going to have a quiet week. I'm not going to do anything. By about day two, I'm like, right, I need something to do now. <laughs> Absolutely. Mate, it's been fascinating talking to you. We're going to finish up, as I've done every episode, with our quick fire questions, if yeah. I can. So, um, one piece of advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Yeah, it's funny. I was listening to your previous guest. Uh, mine is very similar. I would say it doesn't matter what the people around you say that now at 18 say, think about you, you know, anything horrible that you're experiencing. Those people won't be significant in your life and future and focus on you and don't worry about what other people think. It's about you. Love that. Love that. Who's been your biggest inspiration throughout your life and why? Um, that's an interesting one. My parents, but particularly my dad, he, he passed away in 2019 and he, um, got through medical school on a scholarship, like it wasn't from a wealthy background, sort of became a doctor, made the decision to emigrate to the UK, had a really hard time, you know, it was a real inspiration all the way through. And actually my whole extended family that did that, they're all inspiring in doing that. Love that, love it. Um, could you recommend a book or a podcast for our listeners that's had an impact on you? Yeah, there's two. I made a note of them. So um, one of them is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. She's one of my favourite writers. Um, a lot of her books are incredible. And people often talk about Beloved, but The Bluest Eye had a real impact on me and I really recommend it. And it's not a long book to read as well. It's really good. And I've got to talk about a podcast that I've just started listening to. So it's the Archetypes podcast, the Meghan Markle one. Um, so I'm not, a royal, I'm going to, full disclosure, I'm not, I'm anti-royal family, but her podcast, I think she, you know, in lots of ways she is too. Her podcast incredible. If you haven't listened to it, it's really no. worth listening to. Amazing. Yeah. I love that. And finally, what is your one rule for living a fulfilled life? Uh, I'm not sure I always live it, but balance. So a balance of fun travel meeting different people work you know all those different things is definitely um good for a field life and sort of surrounding yourself with positive people in, in all those things you do yeah 
Mo, thank you so much. It's been brilliant. I'm really grateful. Thank you. For- that eight o'clock in the morning or with, 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 with four to go and your enthusiasm and energy has certainly you know lifted me and it's been a brilliant yes. conversation so thank you so much i'm genuinely grateful thanks for your support and um that wish you continued success and you and good luck with the rest of the podcast and your voice let's hope it keeps going all the way through <laughs> we knew that. and that is a wrap thank you so much This is the County Business Talks podcast, produced by H2 Productions.